Nothing exercises a more delightful spell over the imagination than the lingerings of the holiday customs and rural games of former times. They recall the pictures my fancy used to draw in the May morning of life, when as yet I only knew the world through books, and believed it ought to be all that poets had painted it and they bring with them the flavor of those honest days of yore in which, I am apt to think, the world was more homebred, social, and joyous than at present. I regret to say that they are daily growing more and more faint, gradually worn away by time, but still more obliterated by modern fashion. They resemble those picturesque morsels of Greek architecture, which we see by the crumbling various parts of old England, parts to, partly dilapidated by the waste of ages and partly lost in the additions and alterations of later days. Of all the old festivals, Christmas awakens the strongest and most heartfelt associations that lift the spirit to a state of hallowed and ele elevated enjoyment and break forth in full jubilee in the morning that brought peace and goodwill to men. I do not know a grander effect of music on the moral feelings than to hear the full choir and the pealing organ performing a Christmas anthem in a cathedral and filling every part of the vast pile with triumphant harmony. It is a beautiful arrangement also derived from days of yore that this festival which commemorates the announcement of the religion of peace and love has made this season for gathering together of family connections and drawing closer again those bands of kindred hearts which the cares and pleasures and sorrows of the world are continually acting to cast loose, of calling back the children of a family who have launched forth in life and wandered widely asunder once more to assemble about the paternal hearth, that rallying place of the affections, there to grow young and loving again among the endearing mementos of childhood. There is something in the very season of the year that gives a charm to the festivity of Christmas. In the depth of winter, when nature lies despoiled of every charm and wrapped in her shroud of sheeted snow, we turn for our gratifications to moral sources. The dreariness and desolation of the landscape, the short gloomy days, then our thoughts are more concentrated our friendly sympathies more aroused. We feel more sensibly the charm of each other's society and are brought more closely together by dependence on each other for enjoyment. Heart calleth unto heart, and we draw our pleasures from the deep wells of loving kindness, which furnish forth the pure element of domestic felicity. The glow and warmth of the evening fire with its ruddy blaze diffuses an artificial summer and sunshine throughout the room and lights up each countenance in a kindlier welcome. Where does the honest face of hospitality expand into a broader and more cordial smile? Where is the shy glance of love more sweetly eloquent than by the winter fireside? And as the hollow blast of wintry wind rushes through the hall, claps the distant door, whistles about the casement, and rumbles down the chimney, what can be more grateful than that feeling of sheltered security? The great prevalence of rural habitat throughout every class of society have always been fond of those festivals and holidays which agreeably interrupt the stillness of country life. It seems to throw open every door and unlock every heart. One warm, generous flow of joy and kindness. The old halls resounded with the harp and the Christmas carol, and their ample boards groaned under the weight of hospitality. Even the poorest cottage welcomed in the festive season with green decorations of bay and holly. Christmas is still a period of delightful excitement. It is gratifying to see that home feeling completely aroused which holds so powerful a place in every home. The preparations making on every side for the social board that is again to unite friends and kindred. The presence of good cheer passing and repassing, those tokens of regard and quickeners of kind feelings. The evergreens distributed about houses and churches, emblems of peace and gladness, 
All these have the most pleasing effect in producing fond associations and kindling benevolent sympathies. So hallowed and so gracious is the time amidst the general call to happiness, the bustle of the spirits, and the stir of the affections which prevail at this period, who can remain insensible? It is indeed the season of regenerated feelings, the season for kindling not merely the fire of hospitality in the hall, but the genial flame of charity in the heart. The scene of early love again rises green to memory beyond the sterile waste of years. And the idea of home, fraught with the fragrance of home-dwelling joys, reanimates the drooping spirit. <laughs> Thank you. 
when we heard a distant thwacking sound, which informed me as a signal for the serving up of dinner. The household kept up old customs in the kitchen as well as hall, and the rolling pin struck upon the dresser by the cook summoned the family to bring in the meats. <laughs> The dinner was served up in the great hall, where we always held our Christmas banquet. A blazing, crackling fire of logs had been heaped on to warm the spacious apartment, and the flame went sparkling and wreathing up the wide-mouthed chimney that had been profusely decorated with greens for the occasion. The holly and the ivy, likewise, had been wreathed round the opposite hall. A sideboard was set out on which was a display of plates that might have vied the vessels of the temple. Flagons, cans, cups, beakers, goblets, basins, and ewers. The gorgeous utensils of good companionship that had gradually accumulated through many generations of jovial housekeepers. Before these stood two Yule candles, beaming like two stars of the first magnitude. Other lights were distributed in branches, and the whole array glittered like a firmament of silver. We were ushered into this banqueting scene. Never did Christmas board display a more goodly and gracious assemblage of countenances. Those who were not handsome were at least happy, and happiness is a rare improver of your hard-favored visage. We said grace which was the, not the short familiar one, such as commonly addressed to the deity in these unceremonious days, but a long, courtly, well-worded one of ancient school. There was now a pause, as if something was expected, when suddenly the butler entered the hall with some degree of bustle. He was attended by a servant on each side with a large wax light and bore a silver dish on which was an enormous pig's head decorated with rosemary with a lemon in its mouth, which was placed with great formality at the head of the table, the moment this pageant made its appearance. <laughs> There was much laughing and rallying as honest emblem of Christmas joviality. The dinner time passed away in this flow of innocent hilarity, and though the old hall may have resounded in its time with many a scene of broader rout and revel, yet I doubt whether it ever witnessed more honest and genuine enjoyment. How easy to diffuse pleasure around, and how truly is a kind heart a fountain of gladness, making everything in its vicinity to freshen into smiles. The joyous disposition of the worthy company was perfectly contagious. 
happy, and disposed to make all the world happy. And the little eccentricities of our humor did but season in a manner the sweetness of dear philanthropy. When I woke Christmas morning, it seemed as if all the events of the preceding evening had been a dream, and nothing but the identity of the ancient chamber convinced me of their reality. While I lay musing on my pillow, I heard the sound of little feet pattering outside of the door, and a whispering consultation. Presently a choir of small voices chanted forth an old Christmas carol. I rose softly, slipped on my clothes, opened the door suddenly, and beheld one of the most beautiful little fairy groups that a painter could imagine. It consisted of a boy and two girls, the eldest not more than six, and lovely as seraphs. They were going the rounds of the house and singing at every chamber door, but my sudden appearance frightened them into mute bashfulness. They remained for a moment playing on their lips with their fingers, and now and then stealing a shy glance from under their eyebrows until, as if by one impulse, they scampered away. And as they turned the angle of the gallery, I heard them laughing in triumph at their escape. Everything conspired to produce kind and happy feelings in this stronghold of old-fashioned hospitality. Our breakfast consisted of what was denominated true old Christmas fare, while indulged in some bitter lamentations over modern breakfasts of tea and toast which was censured as among the causes of weak nerves and the decline of heartiness. And though our, guest, our host admitted them to his table to suit the palates of his guests, yet there was a brave display of cold meats, wine, and ale on the sideboard. <laughs> Thank you.
we were talking, we heard the distant tolling of the village bell, and I was told that we were a little particular in having our household at church on Christmas morning, considering it a day of pouring out thanks and rejoicing. As the morning, though frosty, was remarkably fine and clear, the most of the family walked to church, which was a very old building of gray stone, and stood near the village about half a mile or so. Adjoining it was a low, snug parsonage which seemed coeval with the church. The front of it was perfectly matted with a yew tree that had been trained against its walls, through the dense foliage of which apertures had been formed to admit light into the small antique lattices. As we passed this sheltered nest, the parson issued forth and preceded us. I had expected to see a sleek, well-conditioned pastor, such as is often found in a snug living in the vicinity of a rich parson's table. But I was disappointed. The parson was a little meager man with a grizzled wig that was too wide and stood off from each ear so that his head seemed to have shrunk away within it like a dried filbert in its shell. He wore a rusty coat with great skirts and pockets that would have held the church Bible and prayer book, and his small legs seemed still smaller from being planted in large shoes decorated with enormous buckles. On reaching the church porch, we found the parson rebuking the gray-headed sexton for having used mistletoe among the greens with which the church was decorated. It was, he observed, an unholy plant profaned by having been used by the Druids in their mystic ceremonies. And though it might be innocently employed in the festive ornamenting of halls and kitchens, yet it had been deemed by the fathers of the church as unhallowed and totally unfit for sacred purposes. So tenacious was he on this point that the poor sexton was obliged to strip down a great part of the humble trophies of his taste before the parson would consent to enter upon the service of the day.
For my part, I was in a continual excitement from the varied scenes of whim and innocent gaiety passing before me. It was inspiring to see wild-eyed frolic and warm-hearted hospitality breaking out from among the chills and looms of winter, and old age throwing off his apathy and catching once more the freshness of youthful enjoyment. I also felt an interest in the scene, from the consideration that these fleeting customs were passing fast into oblivion. There was a quaintness, too, mingled with all this revelry that gave it a peculiar zest, and it suited to the time and place, echoing back the joviality of long-departed years. At the time of the first publication of this paper, the picture of an old-fashioned Christmas in the country was pronounced by some as out of date. The author had afterwards an opportunity of witnessing almost all the customs above described, existing in unexpected vigor where we pass the Christmas holidays. The reader will find some notice of them in the author's account of his sojourn. But enough of Christmas and its gambols. It is time for me to pause in this garrulity. Methinks I hear the questions asked by my graver readers, to what purpose is all this? How is the world to be made wiser by this talk? Alas, is there not wisdom enough extent for the instruction of the world? And if not, are there not thousands of abler pens laboring for its improvement? It is so much pleasanter to please than to instruct, to play the companion rather than the preceptor. What, after all, is the might of wisdom that I could throw into the mass of knowledge? Or how am I sure that my sagest deductions may be safe guides for the opinions of others? But in writing to amuse, if I fail, the only evil is in my own disappointment. If, however, I can by any lucky chance in these days of evil rub out one wrinkle from the brow of care or beguile the heavy heart of one moment of sorrow, if I can now and then penetrate through the gathering film of misanthropy, prompt a benevolent view of human nature, and make my reader more in good humor with his fellow beings and himself, surely, surely I have not then written entirely in vain. Merry Christmas to all. And a happy, prosperous new year.